Hello everyone, it is Mike Levin, Thursday, September 12th, 2019, once again on my way to the Emerald City. And today I thought I'd talk a little bit about obsolescence proofing. So over the years I have been uh, many things at many companies using many technologies, and I have certainly gone the path of the master carpenter, but unlike in actual fields like carpentry where the tools rarely change over the years and you can forever achieve greater and greater mastery uh, similar to things like musical instruments and martial arts weapons the same does not really apply in tech things as fundamental as the keyboard changes underneath of you the concept of the desktop computer changes to the laptop, changes to the tablet, and now our smartphones are the way that we access uh, information tech. And I guess I'm talking mostly about information tech because there's a broad array of technology. Technology is just technique and the way of doing things. Every out, everything outside your human body is tech and I take certain arguments even with that. Your hands are a certain type of technology that evolution has incorporated into your body. So when I'm talking tech, I'm mostly talking about information tech, moving data around um, for people to communicate, uh, for what happens in person to take place over uh, more extended periods of distance and time. And uh, you mix in the visuals and the graphics and whatever other sensory I.O. that normally humans do, and you put a proxy in between, something like your phone, your desktop, whatever. So that's the field I've been in for many years. I started out in digital signage where big TVs were put up back in the days of cathode ray tubes. So you can imagine these were gargantuan beasts. They were not flat panel displays like they are today. And I was getting out of the business, such as my timing, just as things were becoming flat panel, but I had enough of the digital signage industry. And really along the way to that point, I mastered a strange computer that did these visual things really, really well called the Amiga computer from Commodore, but really from the old Atari hardware engineers and a few other uh, cool software people uh, who came into the project and that went away and my skills for the most part became obsolete overnight and I had to relearn on the PC at the time of Windows 3.1 back in I guess the early 90s before the web really was on the scene the net was on the scene the internet uh, but it was not browser based you had to go in and go for and uh, fetch and all these other things that just were not uh, the friendly web that we have today and so uh, when I moved to the Microsoft platform, I thought it was a safe haven. I thought it was the last technology I'd ever have to learn because Microsoft, right? It's not really going away. So I invested a lot in their web technology at the time, which was active server page and some uh, things that went along with it so that you could do time scheduled things on the server, such as the Windows scripting host. And the language was VB script, Visual Basic uh, Scripting Edition, a spin on basic, the basic language, one of the P's in the pool of tech that has been around forever. And uh, JavaScript was mixed in here and there. Microsoft felt they had to emulate the Netscape uh, commerce server, which was big in those very earliest days of the web those first times they tried to do commerce on the web, it was Netscape putting out a web server that used JavaScript on the server long before Node.js. But of course that went away and Microsoft did its strategy of embrace and displace and uh, JavaScript on the server went away again after uh, active server page got sunset. And once again, my skills got obsolete. So I was in this pattern of really embracing tools, mastering them, coming to love them really, creating larger implementations on these things that could have served me as tools 
for the rest of my life, but poof, conditions change and things go away. And really, it makes it a, uh, a frustrating thing to try and be the master carpenter in the tech industry, because when you're starting out, there's really two directions to go in things. You can try to be really good at things and revel in your work, the craft, the skill of the craftsperson. And I always make the connection to the walrus and the carpenter, the poem in Alice in Wonderland, where there's a walrus and a carpenter who eat oysters. And of course, in the Disney version, the walrus gets all the oysters in the end, which is some, you know, serious channeling uh, of truth. But in the original poem, the carpenter gets his share of uh, oysters as well. And I always like to think people who revel in the craft, the uh, awareness of how to do a thing, uh, can and do always get their reward. You can always at least punch a clock as long as you're as skilled as anyone else in the uh, industry you're in and draw a salary and not have the compromise of integrity and soul that comes with being the walrus. So the walrus ultimately is a more powerful individual and character on the planet because the walrus can motivate large numbers of people into action. They're the great leaders, but they are rarely ever doing the work themselves. They rely on people like me to do the implementation work. It's rare when you get the two in the same person and it does happen occasionally, but on my various times to go that more walrusy route, entrepreneurial, uh, in control of everything, having a team underneath of you, um, I've hated it. It's, you know, selling little bits of your soul here and there. And you really got to be an extrovert. You got to be someone who thrives and draws energy on giving pieces of yourself everywhere. I never have. So I've gone the carpenter route and I'm pushing 50. I'm 49 years old now. And here I am on the road to the Emerald City still. Uh, you know, you go where the job market is, you go where the types of jobs are, where people will hire you for your craft, and you resist becoming obsolete in these obsolescence cycles. And one of the things I notice going on right now is the flocking of people onto Microsoft Visual Studio Code, the, I guess, inheritor of the baton from the old uh, IDE, Microsoft Visual Studio, but it's not Visual Studio. It is a more lightweight IDE, Integrated Development Environment, based on components from, of all places, Google, Microsoft's arch enemy. So they ha are using software components from the free and open source world, the pieces that build Chrome, in order to create a text editor, which is the same foundation, the same basis that's used for programs like Slack and a few other things where it's easier to make it multi-platform because Google does all the work of making the Chrome components multi-platform so you can focus on the application itself. And so uh, they did a good job of it. Visual Studio, uh, Visual, Microsoft Visual Code, Visual Studio Code. Uh, I always get the name a little confused, but it's, it's a great text editor. It's one of those power tools, but people are flocking onto it the way people flock from say, text edit to Sublime on the Mac. And there's always a flocking movement where the giant reset button is put, pressed on all your skills because the system of macros change and everything. And of course you're locked into a desktop system where you're using a mouse and windows and uh, Having gone the old school route, I embraced something called VI or Vim, um, which is not a Windows text editor where you just mostly use the keyboard, rarely move your hand away for the mouse, mostly for operating system related things and not for text editing. And you get faster and faster and it's been around since the early 70s, almost as long as Unix has, certainly as long as Linux has. A version of the program is part of the Unix standards, various standards that exist for what comprises a Unix operating system. Unix is, of course, at the heart 
of both, both all, the iPhone, the Macintosh, um, the Android phone, and now, starting soon, Linux, which is a version of Unix, sort of, a black boxed, uh, re-engineered uh, version, with Windows. So, there's really a big deal here of how when you want to be an information professional and you're deciding where to invest yourself for obsolescence proofing, you, as a developer, I'm not talking about a user of desktop software, that whole desktop software argument, that whole which windowing environment you want to use is a non-issue because, you know, once someone knows how to use mouse point and click and touch screens, you can go anywhere. You know, there's no difference between Ubuntu and Windows and Mac, aside from just setting in again because it's so intuitive and user friendly. However, it does not allow you to get into the zone and sort of transport yourself to another place, uh, no matter where you go in life. Now, sure, if you get a system, you watch some people doing their video editing and stuff using Adobe Premiere and they get into the zone in their hand or, their, or Photoshop in their hand and their mind and it all goes together and they're going faster than you can follow. And it can happen, but it's almost always happening under proprietary um, operating systems, stuff that changes and stuff that you have to retrain and be on this rat race hamster wheel of retraining all the time to keep that level of skill. And what I propose is there's another way, a better way, which is just to use the tools that have always been around, are still at the heart of things, will always be around, and really are every bit as good as the other tools out there. Now there's always exceptions, there's always, you know, it's useful to pick up a power tool for a job that calls for a power tool. But these old school tools I'm advocating, a general understanding of Linux, a, uh, a mastery of the Vim text editor, a mastery of the Python programming language, and a fairly good competency with the Git code version controlling system are all that you will need to carry you through decades in your career, even now starting today, even now with everything in change, with machine learning and AI all on the horizon, the systems are gonna be started up and initiated. They're gonna be configured through the things I'm talking about, Linux, Python, Vim, and Git for the most part. Um, so I am advocating uh, starting to learn a little bit of old school to have it in your back pocket as your career develops and you uh, take up other tools and do other things which are what's called for for the jobs, but always having a forever increasing level of competency and muscle memory based uh, mastery that cannot be taken away from you, that it's with you for your entire life. And it's applicable to almost every problem you'll ever encounter. Uh, cuts across all the problem domains, they say. And you can always come up with a solution to a problem that way that sweeps away much of the muss and fuss that you'll encounter when you are called to do it a very particular way using a particular vendor implementation of this or a certain tool of that. And it uh, gives you a broader perspective. It gives you a better understanding of the tasks and jobs you are called upon to do gives you a baseline uh, way of doing things. It might give you a way to mock it up quickly in a working version uh, so that you have it going during the time you work on taking up some new power tool and figuring out how to do it some new way. So it took me a long time to get to that. I picked this, started picking this stuff up all about 10, maybe, maybe 12 years ago. And so I'm about as long into it as you know, Malcolm Gladwell says in his book, uh, Outliers, it takes to become the master carpenter in some field. And I feel it happening. I feel myself thinking in Python, looking at it and saying, I see that like I see English these days. And uh, 
I work with the Vim text editor as if I'm in telepathic communion with the text on the machine. And I think if it's time for me to start making a more formalized presence of myself on the web, maybe teaching some, some courses, um, it's gonna be on this. It's gonna be on how to make the transition to old school so that you have a plan for obsolescence proofing yourself for your entire career. And so anyway, I'm now where I'm going, so I think I'll wrap up and say thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon, and don't forget to subscribe.